All right, I want to begin this evening um, by looking at Luke's Gospel, chapter 24, and just one verse, verse 49, in the words of the Lord Jesus as he commissions uh, his disciples. It says, Behold, I send a promise of my Father upon you, but tarry ye in the city of Jerusalem until you be endued with power from on high. And of course, the Lord is telling them uh, he's going to send them. But before they go, they must be certain that they first are endued with power. That word endued, it's like sinking into a garment. So the idea is this, that the power of God coming upon them, just like a garment would slip down over you, like if you put a pullover on or whatever. That's the picture that is brought before us in this particular scripture. And as we think of D.L. Moody, this is what... Um, Mr. Torrey, R.A. Torrey, had to say, and he's giving the seven reasons why God used D.L. Moody, and it says uh, that he was endued with power from on high. He had a very definite endowment with power from on high. And then he says this, in his early days, he was a great hustler. He had a tremendous desire to do something, but he had no real power. He worked very largely in the energy of the flesh. And so you can imagine him. He was a very energetic man, very enthusiastic man, but he's doing it all in his own strength and the energy of the flesh. And again, was relatively useful because of his persistence and his uh, faithfulness in doing these things. But how did that all change? Well, he says there were two humble free Methodist women who used to come over to his meetings in the YMCA. One was called Auntie Cook and the other uh, Mrs. Snow. <clears throat> These two women would come to Mr. Moody at the close of the meetings and say, we are praying for you. Finally, Mr. Moody became somewhat nettled at them and said to them one night, why are you praying for me? Why don't you pray for the unsaved? They replied, we're pr praying for you that you may get the power implication being you don't have it. Mr. Moody asked the ladies to come and see him, and they prayed together as he could not get the conversation out of his mind, because deep down he knew he didn't have that power that he wanted. Auntie Cook once told me the intense fervor with which Mr. Moody prayed on that occasion. He's desperate for it. He wants it. And he prayed for that constantly. While in New York City and prior to his first visit to the United Kingdom, the power of God fell upon him as he walked up the street in New York City, and he had to hurry off to the house of a friend and ask that he might have a room by himself. In that room, he stayed alone for hours, and the Holy Ghost came upon him, filling his soul with such joy that at last he had to ask God to withhold his hand lest he die on the spot from very joy. <laughs> Amazing to think about. Now, a postscript to the story that I had, and I've told this story many times, but a postscript that I didn't realize was found in the book that I read by Pollock. And the postscript goes like this. All this time, God had been speaking to Moody very directly about leaving Chicago and going out as a full-time evangelist. All his ministry up to now has primarily been in the city of Chicago, and God is speaking to him about leaving that. But he put so much into Chicago that he, he didn't want to leave it. And, of course, God was blessing there. Why would he leave a place where God was blessing? And it was while he was walking down that street in New York City that he finally surrendered, said, not my will, but thy will be done. And at that point, the power of the Spirit came upon him, which again would go along with our thoughts that yieldedness is really the key to the fullness of the Holy Spirit. And if there are areas in our lives that we're refusing to yield, stubbornly determine we're going to do what we want to do, God certainly cannot bless in that way. So he leaves New York and he goes to London. The reason he going, he's going to London, he thinks he's going because he needs rest. But actually, there was a bedridden saint in a church in North London, 
where uh, Mr. Lessie was the pastor. And there was this lady there. Uh, she was a invalid and she was praying Mr. Moody would come and preach in her church. So he thinks he's going because he needs a rest. God has other plans. So the power of God wrought through him mightily in North London. Hundreds were added to the churches. And that was what led to him being invited over to the wonderful campaign that followed in the United Kingdom in later years that really made Mr. Moody famous. But I want to give some more details about that trip to England. It was in June of 1872. Although he was recharged spiritually by his encounter with God in New York, that endowment of power that he had received in New York City, he was still very tired physically. To regain his physical strength, he knew he needed to rest. And so he took this trip to England with the intent of just resting, no preaching. He was going to sit at the feet of some of the Bible teachers in England, learn, study, just have a time of rest. And his wife had encouraged him to because she could see how tired he was. And so while in England at a prayer meeting, Moody encountered Theophilus Lessie, a pastor of a church in the north of London, who asked him to preach in his church, and Moody consented. Moody's conclusion that Sunday morning when he preached in this church was it was the coldest congregation he had ever been in. Following that sermon, he felt it was so cold, it confirmed that he determined he was never going to preach in England again. He was just going to rest. <laughs> Such was the, by the way, we've, some of us experienced that. When you preach in a church, sometimes it feels like you're in a mortuary. It is so spiritually cold and it's a terrible terrible experience and so i can understand why he would say i'm done no more preaching in england this is the coldest place spiritually just think of this one church so he determined he wasn't going to spend any more time preaching there but um, the problem was that he had committed to preach in the evening service as well and so he felt like he he at least had to follow through that but he was dreading it based on the morning experience but this is where we learn about the extraordinary impact of the prayers of an intercessory sister. And again, as I've talked about revival over the years, one of the common threads that I found is the amazing impact of the prayers of godly sisters. And so we've already seen two godly sisters, this Auntie Cook and Mrs. Snow, have already had an impact. But this bedridden woman, a member of Leslie's, uh, Leslie's congregation, had been pleading with God for revival in her church. She read in the paper of the services Moody was having in the United States, and she began to pray earnestly that God would send D.L. Moody to preach at her church. Following the morning service in which Moody preached, the bedridden woman's sister who had attended the service and who was caring for her sister informed her that Moody had preached that morning. The bedridden woman called out, God has answered my prayers. And she told her sister not to prepare her any food. She was going to spend time in prayer and fasting for the evening service. Well, <clears throat> everything changed. During that evening service, Moody recognized that something had changed. And again, what's the result of it? It's this, this woman praying. His biographer wrote the following about that time. It seemed while he was preaching as if the very atmosphere was charged with the Spirit of God. There came a hush upon the people and a quick response to his words. Though he had not been much in prayer that day and could not understand it himself. At the end of his sermon, Moody presented an appeal for anybody who wanted to become a Christian to stand. All over the building, people began to stand. It seemed as if the entire congregation was on its feet. Neither Moody nor Lessie had ever seen a response like this. So Moody presented the invitation again, thinking that maybe they'd misunderstood. And the response was the same. The entire crowd stood at the same time. After further remarks, people were asked to go to a side room to receive additional counsel concerning their decision. 
and extra chairs had to be set up to accommodate all who were making that decision. Sadly, Moody had to leave the next day to go to Dublin, Ireland. But Lessie's church was revived. And as a result of that revival in Lessie's church, invitations began to pour in from out the, throughout the United Kingdom for D.L. Moody to come and preach. And again, the reason was the power of God was evident in those services. Later on, we've said that Moody became very close friends with R.A. Torrey. And R.A. Torrey also uh, believed in this baptism of power for service. And so Moody would constantly urge Torrey to preach two sermons. If ever they were together, he said, I want you to preach two sermons. One is his sermon on 10 reasons why I believe the Bible to be the word of God. Remember that R.A. Torrey had gone to Yale uh, he'd gone to the German higher criticism seminaries and had come out believing entirely in the authority and inspiration of Scripture, much to the uh, the chagrin of the liberals and the higher critics of his day. And so uh, the Moody always wanted him to preach on why I believe the Bible to be the Word of God, because unless God's Word has ultimate authority, if it's been undermined, then we can't make progress and so he he would always have him preach that sermon and the second sermon was on the baptism with the holy ghost to combat powerlessness and deadness in the churches when people did not respond to tory sermons he would say oh why will they split hairs why don't they see that this is just the one thing that they themselves need they're good teachers. They're wonderful teachers. I'm so glad to have them here. But why will they not see that the baptism with the Holy Ghost is just the one touch that they themselves need? On another occasion at a gathering of students at Northfield, remember Moody was a pioneer of the student volunteer movement that eventually morphed into the InterVarsity uh, Christian Fellowship and all those movement. He was kind of really instrumental in the founding of the, the, the work among students. Uh, through his Cambridge campaign. So he invited a group of students to come to Northfield. And again, uh, on this occasion, he pleaded with Tori to preach the sermons on the baptism with the Holy Ghost, what it is, what it does, the need of it, the possibility of it. On Sunday morning, he says, I spoke on the baptism with the Holy Spirit, how to get it. After giving the sermon, Tori said, Mr. Moody has invited us all to go up to the mountain at three o'clock this afternoon to pray for the power of the Holy Spirit. It is three hours to three o'clock. Some of you cannot wait for three hours. You did. You do not need to wait. Go to your rooms, go out in the woods, go to your tent, go anywhere where you can get alone with God and have this matter out with him. So these young men did and again, we read this, the power of God fell upon these young men and they were greatly used around the world as missionaries, preachers, and evangelists. Now, I have to confess to you that I've read Tory's sermons on the baptism of the Holy Spirit. You can get it free on Kindle, the baptism of the Holy Spirit by R.A. Tory. It doesn't cost you anything. Just download it. And I encourage you to read it. However, I have to say I am totally mystified by his exegesis. <laughs> uh, there's a lot of good things in it. There's a lot of very practical things in it. But um, I, I cannot go along with his teaching on the baptism of the Holy Spirit. However, I have to say this. I'm going to use the words of a brother. I read this book. It's called Great Preaching uh, by a man called Glenn Konjurski. And this is what he says. Now, of what possible use can it be for our modern scholastic preachers to contend that they already have the baptism of the Holy Ghost when it is evident to the whole world they do not have the power? Brethren, we want reality. We want the power of the Holy Ghost. The world goes to hell because we have it not. While we contend about words and names, call it whatever you please. Call it the baptism, 
the unction, the anointing, the filling, the fullness, whatever you want to call it, call it that. But for God's sake, he says, for Christ's sake, for the sake of perishing sinners, cease to make an empty profession or an empty doctrine of it and get on your face before God until you possess it. Then will you know by your own happy experience what good preaching is. Now, I find that very searching. I don't agree with Mr. Torrey's uh, approach, but I do believe this. I do believe that there's one baptism that happens to every believer upon conversion. But I do believe from Scripture there are many fillings. And we desperately need the fullness and power of the Holy Spirit. And R.A. Torrey would say this. It's not just for preachers. Sunday school teachers need the fullness of the Holy Spirit. Housewives, homeschool moms, it doesn't matter what your responsibility is, you need that power of the Holy Spirit. And it's very evident, very evident, that in the day we find ourselves in, there is so much powerless preaching. And I'm not talking about anywhere else, I'm talking about in our own circles. So whatever it is, whatever you want to call it, brethren, we need to get it. <laughs> and the world needs it. Holy Spirit, powerful preaching. The promise is, you shall be endued with power from on high. We need to make sure that we have that power from on high. And I think we need to linger long in the closet and say, Lord, I'm not going to come out of here till I get it. <laughs> I need that power. So may God encourage us from D.L. Moody, from R.A. Torrey. And by the way, this man that I was reading, he lists all the individuals that said that they had this experience, including men like Martin Lloyd-Jones, who twice had those experiences in his writings. God used these men. And so we might claim we, we have it, but it's very evident when we open our mouths that many of us do not have it. <laughs> may God encourage us with these thoughts. Amen. Yeah.